We want to continue this morning our current series on embracing the essentials of true Christianity as we study the scriptures again regarding the carnal mind. So let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Mike came to put his faith in Christ as a child and even attended a Christian school. But though he was responsive to the Word of God as a teen, he began to drift more and more from the Lord as he got older and turned more and more to the world to fill the emptiness in his life. Mike unfortunately died at the age of 32 due to chronic drunkenness. Joe came to trust Jesus Christ as he is presented in the gospel due to seeing a need because of marital problems in his life. And the Lord not only changed his destiny, but began to transform his life. He loved to hear the word of God and he loved to witness to others. As he grew in the Lord, eventually he even had opportunities to teach the word of God over the pulpit in his local church. But Joe had a problem with pride. And wanted so bad to be right, he couldn't face or admit when he was wrong. And he couldn't take correction either. So eventually he butted heads with the spiritual leadership of his local church, and, and he began, became very bitter. Joe still attends church and is involved with certain church activities, but he's dying on the inside. And the root of bitterness has stolen the joy of the Lord out of his life. And then there was Jody. She heard the gospel at a young age and trusted Jesus Christ alone to save her. But Jody grew up in a very legalistic home where law instead of love was the atmosphere and attitude that prevailed. Consistent with legalism, the emphasis was on rules instead of relationship. Performance instead of a personal walk with the Lord. With an atmosphere of conditional love instead of unconditional love. And a double standard where the parents demanded obedience from the children while flagrantly violating the word of God themselves. As is not common in these kind of situations, Jody rebelled as she got older against the legalism and went the other way and indulged her flesh in license. Before she came to her senses, Jody was pregnant and her life was crumbling around her. And if that wasn't bad enough, she made another seriously flawed decision and married an unbeliever. Lastly, there was Gary. Gary also grew up in a Christian home and attended a sound Bible teaching, grace-oriented church. And Gary was saved by the grace of God through faith alone in Christ alone at a young age and was basically a good kid growing up. As Gary was older, he married a believer and started to have children. Nothing externally was seriously wrong in Gary's life except he deceived himself into thinking that his morality was spirituality. As Gary fitted the Lord into his life when it was convenient. As he basically lived an independent life on his own terms. Seldom fellowshipping with other believers except on his terms. And willing to follow God's blueprint of the local church. And willing to submit to spiritual leadership. Unwilling to take correction. For Gary was doing fine spiritually, at least in Gary's eyes. As he lived in his own little spiritual bubble. Now all four of these hypothetical but very realistic illustrations have one thing in common. <coughs> what is it? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Like these Corinthian Christians, all four of my lifelike illustrations had in common that they were or they became carnal Christians. Christians, yes. Spiritual Christians, no. Carnal Christians, yes. They describe what we've been studying in Romans chapter 8, where we read, 
in verse 5 that you have two options in your Christian life. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. A death-like existence. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. And today we want to examine several truths about the carnal Christian. The first principle being that the carnal Christian is a biblical reality you must face and understand. The carnal Christian is a biblical reality you must face and understand. In verse 1 again we read, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as unto spiritual people, but as unto carnal as to babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you are not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there's envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? We see here four times in four verses, the fact that Paul describes these believers as carnal. Four times in four verses. Now let's define our term. What does carnal mean? The Greek word is sarkinos or sarkikos, and it means characterized by the flesh. In other words, dominated by the sin nature. You see the word sark is the word for flesh. And the word ikos carries the idea of what dominates you. For example, when you think of someone who has a big nose, for example, that's the first thing that might come to your mind. You know, he's big nose ikos. You know. He's dominated by his nose. Or you see that person's got a big mouth. When you think of them, what do you think of their big mouth? Or you might say, he's a really heavy smoker. That's what characterizes them. And what Paul is saying here is what characterized these believers was they were dominated by their sin nature. Now you might be thinking, Pastor Dennis, the reality of the carnal Christian is obvious, isn't it? Well, perhaps to you and me and to those who don't approach the scriptures with a theological bias, that requires that the scriptures mean anything here than that these believers were carnal. I think it's very clear. But how does the false teaching of lordship salvation view the carnal Christian? Let me have two of the teachers of lordship answer this for themselves. Dr. John MacArthur, a lordship proponent, says, In scripture, the words carnal and fleshly most often refer to unsaved people and not Christians. Well, most often means it must refer to Christians too, though. The carnal mind, as referred to in Romans 8, 5 through 8, directly defies God, which is not at all characteristic of a true believer. Therefore, a carnal Christian is a contradiction in terms. There may be Christians who fall into sin and act carnally, but carnality is predominantly characterized by unbelievers because they are totally unable to please God. Hebrews 12, 14 declares that no man will see the Lord without holiness. Now, frankly, Hebrews 12, 14 says, no one will see the Lord in your life is the idea without holiness. This verse is wrenched out of its context. But Dr. John MacArthur does claim a carnal Christian is a contradiction in terms. He goes on to write, if a person's life is not characterized by righteousness, the entire book of 1 John declares that he's not truly saved. The person with a disobedient nature is not walking in the spirit. Well, that's true. And may therefore not even possess the Spirit, in which case he is not a Christian. Submission to the will of God, to Christ's Lordship, and to the guiding of the Spirit is an essential, not optional, part of true saving faith. Now this raises a lot of relevant questions. If your life will be characterized by righteousness, if you're truly saved, 
Can someone be 100% assured that they're saved when they trust in Christ as Savior? Or must they wait to see if they have enough fruit later to prove it? And if a person's life is not characterized by righteousness, and suppose he's not truly saved, to what degree, in what areas, and how often must this be true before you can know for sure that you're saved? And is the book of 1 John about a series of tests about salvation or about fellowship with the Lord? In fact, Lord willing, we'll have out by the Fall Bible Conference a little booklet I've just written called How to Interpret 1 John. And in doing so, I show that this test of life view is totally contrary to 1 John, let alone the rest of the Bible. Can you know the moment you put your faith in Christ that you're saved? Or do you have to wait and see if you live a righteous life? And by the way, if that was true, how would Paul ever think the Corinthians were saved? For all they had was pride, division, that a case of ongoing unrepentant sexual immorality, that a case where people were getting drunk at church, that a case where they had marital issues, they had one problem after another. And yet, what does he say, chapter 3, verse 1? And I, brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, even as to babes in Christ. He doesn't doubt their salvation. But he recognizes their carnality. Another teacher of lordship salvation, Paul Washer, dogmatically states, and I quote, Though I want us to look at something that is so very important, particularly in Baptist life, but in all evangelical life in America. We have developed a God who has the power to justify men, who fulfills all his promises in justifying the believer, but he's no longer a God who has the power to sanctify those whom he, who he justifies. Let me pause for a minute. Does he have the power to sanctify us? Yes, of course he does. But don't we have to be willing to let him? Does he have the power to justify? Yes. But don't we have to trust in Christ for it to happen? He goes on. You see, he is giving a promise here about salvation. This salvation I have promised you, I will complete every word of it. But in America today, we have all kinds of people who are supposedly saved. God has the power to justify them, to free them from sin. But these very people never grow in grace. They never grow in sanctification. They're never transformed. They always remain the same, carnal and worldly. And they fill up our churches. They make up the majority of people in the churches. God has the power to save, but he does not have the power to save completely. And that is totally foreign to everything the Bible teaches on salvation. Salvation is a past tense event in the fact that he has justified his people, but it's also a present tense event in the fact that all those whom he justifies, he sanctifies. What's wrong with that? Those he justifies, he sanctifies positionally, But does he sanctify them practically? Well, if they're willing. But what about when they're not? What about the Corinthians? Four times in four verses, you are carnal. He goes on to say, as a matter of fact, in the scriptures, in true historical Baptist teaching. By the way, whenever I see that, it just drives me crazy. It's like someone scratching fingernails on a chalkboard. What's this Baptist teaching? Why don't we just say biblical teaching? And in almost all true evangelical denominations, God's work of sanctification is the evidence that he's truly justified a man. There's no such thing as a continuously carnal Christian. Let me read that again. There's no such thing as a continuously carnal Christian. Verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you're not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able, for you are still carnal. Why don't you read your Bible? Right there. Well, that doesn't fit my theology. Oh, then change your theology. This is not rocket science. He goes on to say, it's not in the Bible. It's not in church history. It's a fabrication of American Christianity. And of course, we have to have it because it's the only way we can explain that the great majority of most of our churches are carnal and worldly. But you know... If indeed there's no such thing as a continuously carnal Christian, it raises the question, well, can a person be carnal for two minutes and still be a Christian? How about two hours? How about two weeks? How about two months? How about two years? Because when Paul was writing this, it was probably at least two to three years delayed 
from when they had become Christians. And I say this because, again, verse 3 states, For you are still carnal. For where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? And you know what's so bothersome about all this? Isn't the fact that it is true there are those who profess to be saved that are not. But they're not saved because of evidence by carnality in their life. It's because their faith isn't in Christ alone. On the other hand, what it does is it undermines the assurance of people. So that they can grow. So it takes the spotlight off of Jesus Christ and his finished work. And it puts it right here and says, now how are you doing? How is your walk? How is your sensitivity towards men? How is your love of the brethren? Well, indeed, those may be issues related to fellowship. We don't examine ourselves to know whether we're saved then. Otherwise, how would Paul ever know these people were saved? How did he know? He knew because they were in Christ. How did they get in Christ? They had put their faith in him alone. And while the carnal Christian isn't an enigma of sorts, for while the carnal Christian is going to heaven when he dies, he's presently living like those who are going to hell. While the carnal Christian has a new nature due to the second birth, he's living under the control of the sin nature he received due to his first birth. While the carnal Christian now has the capacity to understand divine viewpoint, he's largely functioning under human viewpoint. And while the carnal Christian may be moral or immoral in his behavior, he's not spiritual. In other words, not controlled by the Holy Spirit. And because of that, he doesn't have the desire he should have for the Word of God. He doesn't have the application of the Word of God into their lives. Or maybe they're wanting to do God's will, but they're trying to do it their way. So why did Paul view these individuals as believers? It was because of their simple faith in Christ. Not because of their spiritual walk and works. For again, they were carnal. Go back to chapter 1 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And notice how the book begins. And I will tell you, Paul is awfully gracious for him to find something positive to say about this church. And what he says is something which God has done for them. What does he... Or how does he describe... The recipients of this letter. Verse 1. Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ. Through the will of God and Sosthenes our brothers. To the church of God which is at Corinth. To those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. That's positional. To those who are called saints. To be as an italics. With all those in every place. Call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Both theirs and ours. Notice. He is writing to the church. Again at Corinth, to those who were sanctified positionally, how do you know that? Notice the phrase, in Christ Jesus. And as a result, they were called saints. And yet, as we read 1 Corinthians, they looked hardly saintly. Look at verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but Christ sent me to do what? To preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is viewed as foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is viewed as the power of God. Verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached. Now watch this. To save those who, what? Believe. You mean to tell me if they believe the message of the gospel? If they believe the message of the cross? If they believe, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that Christ died for their sins? According to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures in which he was then seen. You mean to tell me if they believe that message, they're saved? That's exactly what the Bible says. If their faith is in Christ alone, if they understand the payment for sin is done, and Christ rose from the grave to give them eternal life. And they put their faith in Christ alone. They are saved regardless of how they are living today. It's not an issue of behavior. It's an issue of birth. 
It's not a change in your life. It's first of all a change in your destiny. From a hell you deserve to a heaven you don't. Verse 22, for the Jews request a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach what Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block and to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and Christ, the wisdom of God. You see, the gospel is all about a person, Jesus Christ, God who became a man. A work that he died and he rose again. An accomplishment that when he died, he died for our sins, which is only attached to his death, because on that cross, he paid for our sin completely. And the only response that is, God is looking for is faith alone in Christ alone, in light of what he's done. And that's why Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, it's not of works, lest anyone should boast. And yet, unfortunately, while I agree with Washer in the sense there are many churches where people are filled, with, with, those churches are filled with people who really are not saved. It's not because they're not living the life after. They're not walking the walk. It is because instead of their faith being in Christ alone, they, they think you have to ask Jesus into your heart or get baptized or repent from your sins or avoid big sins. In fact, you know, last night I was making my way over here to the church to do some study for preparation for tonight, today. And on my way, I have the Christian radio station on. And in doing so, the guy said, and, you know, you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ. And he said, yeah. Now let's bow our heads and hearts. And he says, in the quietness of your heart, would you just confess your sins and repent from your sins and turn from your sins and turn to Christ and be saved? And I was ready to put my foot through the radio. <laughs> I said, now what verse in the world would you ever come up with those three things to do? When the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And that's the confusion of our day. And when someone gets saved, they realize it's not a matter of asking Jesus in their heart, or getting baptized, or repenting of their sins, or somehow avoiding big sins. It's a matter of faith alone, and Christ alone. And they have eternal life. And so the carnal Christian is a biblical reality. You must face and you must understand. If you're not going to understand the Bible, if you're going to understand believers. But number two, the carnal Christian needs to be distinguished from the natural man and the spiritual man. It needs to be distinguished from the natural man and the spiritual man. So we go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Mark, turn that fan on for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We begin in verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, you must understand the natural man, Sukikos, the soulish man, an individual who's dominated by his soul, that is human wisdom instead of divine revelation, starting with the gospel. This particular Greek word, Sukikos, is used in Jude, verse 19, these are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the Spirit. You see, the natural man is void of the Holy Spirit and therefore does not have the capacity to truly act upon divine revelation through divine means. He's unsaved, he's not wired for sound. And by the way, expect natural people to live like natural people. Expect unbelievers to live like unbelievers because they're unbelievers. And what do we see is true of them? Number one, they do not receive, they do not welcome to themselves the things of the Spirit of God. They may have heard the gospel, but they have not received the gospel. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And that's why you don't try to teach Bible to unbelievers. Because you've got to be wired for sound to get it. And you have to be filled with the Spirit to apply it. And they don't have the Spirit. 
So that's one person you must distinguish, the natural man. The second is found in verse 15. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Now the Greek word translated spiritual is pneumatikos. You see that word pneuma? That means spirit. It's the ikos, again, the dominating factor. They're characterized by the nomination of the Holy Spirit in their lives. But in contrast to the natural man, he who is spiritual judgeth all things. The word judge here carries the idea of discerns. They discern things. How do they discern them? Here's how. They allow the Spirit of God to take the Word of God to give them divine viewpoint and a perspective on the situation. They're not, they don't get personal revelation from the Holy Spirit. They get divine illumination through the Word of God by means of the Holy Spirit. So they can discern right from wrong biblically. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. In other words, the unsaved and even the carnal cannot properly judge the spiritual believer because they aren't thinking that way. And inevitably, people project upon you what they would do or how they would think in the situation. And when they're, they are unsaved or carnal, they're going to judge incorrectly. And so we see here that the spiritual man is indwelt by the Spirit and he's controlled by the Spirit, using the Word of God to discern the truth and God's will. And that's why the very next verse says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we, the spiritual believers, we have the mind of Christ. Where do you get the mind of Christ? You get the mind of Christ where? In the Word of God. That's where you get it. You want to know how Jesus Christ thinks? You want to know how God wants you to think? Then you need to know what the Word of God has to say. And so we see three categories of people here. You've got a natural man. You've got a, a spiritual and a carnal. Natural is unsaved. No spiritual assets. No real capacity for spiritual truth. Negative towards spiritual truth. The spiritual believer is saved in Christ and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. He really doesn't have any problems. Not that he doesn't have issues, trials, areas of growth, all of that. But no problem as far as the truth of the Word of God is concerned. In fact, he has a positive attitude towards spiritual truth. He's, he's running things through the grid of the Word of God to know God's will and God's Word in a matter. Where the carnal person is saved in Christ and dwelt by the Spirit, but he's controlled by the old sin nature rather than the Holy Spirit. And it issues out in disobedience to God's Word as he walks like an unbeliever. And that is why you must distinguish between the natural man and the spiritual man and the carnal man. You've got to understand that. You know, I remember years ago when I was teaching this, a lady came up to me and she said this, that was so helpful today, now I understand my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Principle number three. The carnal Christian possesses a wonderful eternal position in Christ while having a woeful temporary condition in time. Wonderful position, woeful condition. And that's what he says in verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Did Paul think they were saved? Yes. Look at the terms again. Brethren, family term. Part of the family of God. In Christ, positional identity. And yet, by way of their condition, they were carnal. And you must distinguish position from condition. The moment someone is saved, they are now placed by the Holy Spirit from being in Adam to now being in Christ. They now enter the family of God and have the privilege of having fellowship with God. But when they walk by sight and they walk by their feelings or they yield to their sin nature, they get out of fellowship with the Lord. And they are carnal. And in doing so, they then will reap corruption in their life. 
When they yield to the Lord or confess to the Lord, they are restored to fellowship where now they can grow in the Lord and keep walking with Him. Because the Christian life is really a walk of faith. A faith in Jesus Christ. And as a result, when one is walking by faith, they're responding to the Lord in their own personal love relationship with Him. They're responding to who He is. They're responding to what He's done. They're responding to the promises and the principles of the Word of God. And as a result, the Holy Spirit, whose desire is to teach us the Word of God, is free to then do that and produce in our life the fruit of the Spirit. This is what he wants to do. Which leads us to principle number four. The carnal Christian will lack anticipated spiritual growth or will retrogress in his growth instead of making progress in their spiritual maturity. Again, the carnal Christian will lack anticipated spiritual growth or will retrogress in his growth instead of making progress in their spiritual maturity. And I, brethren, cannot speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Now, the word babes reminds us of their growth. I fed you with milk. What do babes need? Milk. And not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. You see, we have a case with the Corinthian church of protracted spiritual infancy. They had plenty of time to grow, to be moving on from being a babe in Christ, and yet they had it. Now, this is a little different than the Hebrew believers that we've studied about in the past, who had grown, but they retrogressed in their life and became dull of hearing and needed to hear the basics again. And unfortunately, that could be true of you here today. You may have been part of Duluth Bible Church for here, years. You may have heard message after message. But it doesn't mean you've grown. And you may have grown for a while, and now you've retrogressed. And if we could look at you with spiritual x-ray glasses on, you would have a nook in your mouth and diapers on your bottom. Just having, you're not growing. You're not growing. Because, you know, hearing the Word of God is not enough. It has to be mixed with faith in your own personal walk with the Lord. And that's why I can't make you spiritual. I'd like to, but I can. Only you can respond to the Lord. And I can point you to Him. I can teach you the Word of God. I can be like Paul. I fed you with milk. I can teach you the Scriptures. But when it comes right down to it, you have to respond to the Lord. Now, that was true when it came to being saved from the penalty of sin. You had to take God at His word and believe Him. But the same is true in being saved from the power of sin in your own walk with the Lord. It's a walk again of faith in which you learn to respond by faith to the Lord in your own walk with Him. And we've been studying about this in Romans 6, and Romans 7, and Romans 8. And as you walk by faith and yield in dependence upon the Lord, the Holy Spirit produces in your life the fruit of the Spirit. And He produces in your life divine good that please the Lord. But you know, as I think of carnal, spiritual versus being a babe, there is a difference between being spiritual and being mature. You see, spirituality is an absolute. Either you're filled by the Spirit or controlled by the flesh at any given moment of your Christian walk. You're either abiding in a dependent condition of faith and fellowship with Christ or you are not. However, Christian growth is in degrees from being a babe to an adolescent to being a mature believer, though at any given moment you can still be either controlled by the flesh or by the Spirit. And so God wants us to grow. He wants us to grow from being a babe in Christ, as it were, to being a spiritual adolescent, to being a mature believer. And, and indeed, growth transpires in our life when we're responding to the Lord and to His Word and allowing the Spirit of God to direct us and enable us in our life in honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And the word of God has a very important part in that. Because again, we saw in verse 2, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. You see, to walk with the Lord, to walk by faith, faith comes by hearing again and hearing by the word of God. And what happens is too often believers aren't growing. Too often there's some initial growth perhaps or a spark or desire, but pretty soon they get distracted or someone hassles them a little bit for their faith or, or something else and boom, they just start to not grow or to retrogress. Or they get bitter. They got corrected somewhere along the way and didn't take it. And it's all their bud. They just aren't moving on in their Christian life. <coughs> There's nothing wrong with milk. Milk's a good thing. But indeed, God wants to get us beyond the milk only stage to the meat of the word as well. And that doesn't mean that we no longer need to hear the gospel as the gospel is the foundation for everything. For the difference between milk and meat, in my estimation, is while the gospel is milk, the meat are the ramifications and implications of that gospel as it relates to our lives. And you know, in some churches, the word of God is largely missing and replaced with pop psychology or anecdotal stories or human viewpoint that just are not true to the Word of God. On the other hand, just because you're attending a Bible teaching church that teaches the Bible verse by verse doesn't mean you're growing if there is an application of the Word of God in your life. And you know, isn't it funny where we will say more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, than the honeycomb? And yet when it comes right down to it, do we really desire the Word of God like that? Someone asked me this week, is it, is it wrong to move to be part of a good, sound Bible church? And my answer would be, would you move for a job? Someone would say, well, yes. Would you move to go to a certain school, a college somewhere? Well, yes. Well, if... The Word of God is more to be desired than gold. Why would not someone consider moving to be part of a good local church? And I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm just saying there's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, I think it has a lot of wisdom to it. I wouldn't think twice of doing that. But then sometimes they move and they, they, they live so far out, they, they hardly attend. Or they just get distracted or whatever. I'll tell you, I was very encouraged in having a conversation with a believer here a few weeks ago that I've known for years. And he told me how he lives some 38 miles from Heritage Trail Bible Church. And yet, when the, he said when the, the, uh, his uh, wage came in every two weeks or whatever it was, he set aside a certain amount of money so that they could have gas to make the drive and did that for years. And they're really glad they do. And I can't help but think, isn't it funny how we can spend money? In fact, you know, I, I'm convinced the average <coughs> believer spends more money on a vacation for a week than sometimes they give for the whole year. And then we ask ourselves, what's wrong with our priorities? And where are we at? And you see, what happens when a believer is functioning like this PowerPoint slide, so often they're operating by their emotions and human viewpoints. Instead of walking by faith in the word of God. In fact, just ask yourself this week, when that trial came your way, did you respond or did you react? Did you turn to the Lord? Did you say, Lord, how would you have me to think? How would you have me to respond here? Or did you just react in your flesh? Where were you at? In your own walk with him. We're really good at reacting and really bad at responding. Have you noticed? But as you learn to walk by faith in the Lord, enabled by the Holy Spirit, you will spiritually grow. And as you spiritually grow, you will better understand how to walk by faith by means of the Spirit. Kind of like a cat chasing its tail. Which leads me to principle number five. The carnal Christian may be in this condition due to weakness or willfulness. Due to weakness or willfulness. 
Again, verse 1, And I, brethren, cannot speak to you to spiritual people, but as to carnal, sarkinos, as to babes in Christ. Verse 3, For you are still carnal, sarkikos, for where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Now, there seems to be two different Greek words translated carnal. And I'm not trying to make more out of the Greek than is there. But I do think it is safe to say this, that some believers live carnal lives because they're new believers, they, they're weak as it were in the faith, they really don't know how to walk by faith, and, and, and living after the flesh comes natural. They're just carnal weak. But then there are others who are carnal willful in the sense that they are choosing to live after the flesh. They're choosing to live out of fellowship from the Lord. And there's a difference. For indeed, every believer has the same identification with Christ, Romans 6, and now have the opportunity of practical sanctification in their life, Romans 6, 7, and 8, in view of their ultimate glorification, Romans chapter 8. But is it not true that in Romans 7 we have studied where Paul was not carnal willful, he was carnal weak. He wanted to do what was right, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. He had to learn that just because he wanted to walk with the Lord doesn't mean he had the ability and strength to do it, that he needed to depend upon the Lord for that to be the case. He wasn't carnal willful, I would say he was carnal weak. Which leads me to principle number six. The carnal Christian spiritual condition will not be automatically corrected over time. Will not be automatically corrected over time. In 1 Corinthians 3, what do we read again? I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now, until now, you were not able to, and even now, you're still not able, for you are still carnal. In other words, time has lapsed, but carnality has persisted. Because time doesn't still mean you're going to respond by faith. It doesn't mean you're going to apply the Word of God in your life. Do you really think over time that that child of yours, once they leave your home, are going to truly change? You wish that's the case. You hope that's the case. But unfortunately... He marries a gal and views her as a mother more than a wife. There to pick up for him, as it were, because he hasn't grown. Hasn't grown. See, his condition hasn't corrected automatically over time. And I say that because, again, as newborn babes, you have to choose to desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And the word desire there is in the active voice. This is something you need to choose. Choose what? The milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And then when you choose the word, you need to learn to be a doer. And the word means an applier is the idea. And not hearers only, otherwise you're just going to deceive yourself. You think you're farther along than you are because you've heard a lot, but it doesn't mean you've applied it in your life. And that's why principle number seven, the carnal Christian, will be characterized by the works of the flesh instead of the fruit of the Spirit in his daily walk. The works of the flesh. When Paul says you're still carnal, wouldn't you, the logical question be, well, how do you know that? Verse three, for where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? By the way, where does envy come from? Where does strife come from? Where do divisions come from? They are the works of the flesh. Galatians 5, 19 and 21 make that clear. See the word envy? Notice, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, see envy right there? There it is. See that word contentions? That is our word translated strife. In 1 Corinthians 3. You see that word dissensions? 
That's our word translated divisions in 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. In other words, where does this come from? It comes from the works of the flesh. By the way, envy seems to deal more with attitude. When there's envy, then there's strife. That deals with action. And as a result of envy and strife, there are divisions. That speaks of results. As the proof of the root is in the fruit, in this case. The works of the flesh. Now that is in contrast to the believer who's walking under the power of the Holy Spirit, responding to the Lord and to His Word. For in contrast to the works of the flesh, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And against such there is no law. What a difference. But that's not what you're reading about in 1 Corinthians. You're reading about envy and strife and division. Why? Because they were carnal. And it had stunted their spiritual growth. Which leads us to principle number eight. The carnal Christian will conduct himself in such a way that he is thinking and behaving like an unbeliever. He is thinking and behaving like an unbeliever. Now, he's a believer, he's saved, but he's thinking he's behaving like an unbeliever. Where do you find that? Look at verse 3. For you are still carnal. Where there's envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and what? Behaving like mere men. You're behaving like mere men. You're behaving like a natural man. You're behaving like someone who's not saved. You're behaving like someone who doesn't have the Spirit. <clears throat> you see, again, the carnal believer is the one whose mind and his pursuits are on the things of the flesh. Focus on self. Human viewpoint. Living for the temporary. The world's purposes and pursuits. Operating out of pride and self-dependence. Living as if you're still in Adam. Behaving like mere. In fact, that phrase is interesting for the word behaving like. The Greek word for light is kata anthropos. Kata means according to the norms and standards. Anthropos is the word for mankind. In other words, you're living your life according to the norms and standards of the world. Of mankind. In contrast to the word of God. You see, spiritual believers keep going back to the Word of God. They keep going back to what saith the Lord. They keep seeking out the mind of Christ. How would the Lord have me to think here? What does the Word of God say about this? Where the carnal believer just walks according to the standards and norms of the world. And the fact of the matter is when we get saved, we all bring baggage into the Christian life. And yet the Lord wants to transform our thinking by taking in the word of God. And we recognize we have three enemies, the flesh, the world, and the devil. And that Satan seeks to use the world to draw us away from a walk with the Lord and to get us to conform to the world. Where the Spirit of God wants to transform us by the renewing of the mind and the word of God. And frankly, some of the believers from DBC... Go to college and get inundated, especially in the humanities, and as a result, exposed to hours and hours of human viewpoint classes, and it affects them. It affects them. And sometimes now their their faith is undermined, or they start to, you know, be big on social justice causes and other things like that, and they miss the greatest cause, the cause of Jesus Christ. And they miss the greater issue. And they miss even the greater social justice issues, for that matter. You want to start with social justice? Why don't you just start with dealing with abortion? And the 50 plus million babies that have been aborted or murdered. You see, you stay long enough in a barn and you start smelling like a barn after a while. And what were the Corinthians Christians still impressed with and operating under? Human wisdom. 
human wisdom. And there's a lot of human wisdom floating around in our world. And if you're not careful, pretty soon it starts to defile your thinking as well. There's no place for this on your handouts. You might want to put it in the back or you might not want to write it down at all because I'm going to move pretty quick. But let me just give you some human wisdom of our day. One is postmodernism, the human wisdom that assaults the existence of absolute truth or the knowing of absolute truth in which reality is supposedly in the mind of the beholder. And yet, what did our Lord say to those who had believed in Him in John 8? 30 and 31, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Now watch this. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Jesus Christ said there's such a thing as the truth, and it's something you can know. And again, it goes right back to abiding in his word, continuing his word. Instead of listening to the lies that are so prevalent in our world. But remember, the Word of God is of no value to you personally unless you take it to heart and believe it for yourself. Here's another human wisdom of our day. It's called pragmatism. The human wisdom that assaults the priority of God's truth by stating, in effect, if it works, then do it. Instead of first asking, is it true? See, John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We want to do God's will, God's way, according to God's word. See, the pragmatic approach is just again. If it works, just do it. But what if it's not the way God wants it done? What if you find some kind of peace through some new age visualization? Is that what God wants? Because it, quote, seems to work. Or the world, or I should say the church, has been inundated with the world's marketing techniques to so-called build the church. And some churches know more about Peter Drucker than they know about Jesus Christ. And as a result, they build the church numerically. But is it what God wants? Just because it seems to work quote, however that's evaluated, doesn't mean it's what God wants. And you know what has always been encouraging to me is that Christ never asked any pastor, including me, to build the church. He said, I will build my church, and why compete? He's told me to preach the word, to be instant in season and out of season, to reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Third bit of human wisdom of our day is Darwinism, evolution. The human wisdom disguised as science in which nobody times nothing equals everything. Through undesigned processes occurring by random chance and accident over billions of years instead of the acknowledging of God as creator and a literal seven day creation. And you know, all you have to do is read Genesis 1 and take it for what it's worth and it tells you exactly. God created everything in seven literal 24-hour days. He did it apart from an evolutionary process. And when he was done, he said, it's very good. And that's why, you know, when you, you read your local news, you know, I, I have to chuck whenever I say, you know, human-like creature found in South Africa 40 billion years old, you know, or something. And yet, evolution has shaped, again, the thinking of so many people. And encouraged, really, agnosticism on the part of many college students. And here's another piece of human wisdom over day. It's called narcissism. The human wisdom that is occupied with self-love and self-esteem <coughs> instead of Jesus Christ. Did you know in 2 Timothy 3, verse 2, it tells us there's... in the Last days, dangerous times will come. The first thing that's mentioned is men shall be lovers of themselves. That's narcissism. Lovers of themselves. You know, and that's what we have today. We have a whole generation that's grown up kissing themselves in the mirror. And then you hear, you know, things on Oprah and whatever. You've got to love yourself. You've got to trust yourself. You've got to believe in yourself. 
And frankly, if you aren't asking yourself, what does the word of God say? You start to buy into that. You could be like this guy here. Well, enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think about it? <laughs> when I found that years ago, I laughed so hard. I still laugh every time I find that. You know, Satan has just one string to his fiddle, but what a variety of tunes he plays. Look out for number one. Here's another piece of human wisdom of our day, materialism. The human wisdom that exalts the physical over the spiritual, resulting in the covetousness and lust of things. And you know what's interesting is the second thing on that list in 2 Timothy 3, about perilous times will come. Number one, men shall be lovers of their own selves. Number two, men shall be lovers of money. Number two thing on the list is money. Yeah, that's, that's what materialism is. I found it on you. Google Images. I, I didn't write that, by the way. And, and let's face it, so often that's what's driving people, isn't it? You know what the Lord Jesus said? Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Here's another piece of human wisdom of our day. It's called hedonism. <laughs> the human wisdom that pursues personal pleasure as the highest goal instead of the doing of God's will for his glory, even if it means suffering for Christ. You see, what's also interesting is on that list of the last days, men shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And yet later in that same passage, it says, Yea, all them that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, the mentality of too many people are eat, drink, and be merry. Life's just a party. And unfortunately, even for believers, too many are like Demas who hath forsaken us, having loved this present world. Another piece of human wisdom of our day is what I would call youthism. The human wisdom that promotes the incessant desire to look physically young. Incessant desire to look physically young. Remember Proverbs 31, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Or Psalm 147, 10. Did you know that God does not delight in the strength of a man's legs? So when you watch your favorite football team today, remember that. God's not impressed. In fact, he says bodily exercise profits just a little. But godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and that which is. You know, there's people who just, they just really want to look young all their life. Now, I don't know what that's like, because I've looked older than I was all my life. <laughs> I started to lose my hair at 16. But I know that there are some people, I mean, that's their great desire. And I think, hey, come on. You're 65 years old. Why are you trying to pour yourself into those hip jeans, you know? I mean, come on. <laughs> Just face reality. And remember, man looks at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks where? He looks at the... Here's another piece of human wisdom of our day. It's called gender equality and confusion. The human wisdom that blurs the differences of the sexes and the destruction of biblical roles. You know what's so amazing is when you read the Bible in 1 Corinthians 1, excuse me, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, you read God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He created male and female. And frankly, when we can't figure out any longer who's male and who's female, we got a problem. You can't figure out if you're a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, there's a problem. You know, gender neutrality insults the obvious and insults the truth of the Word of God as well. And God has designed biblical roles in the context of marriage and such. And yet we have this being constantly attacked 
through the various media sources of our day. In fact, I, I read this week from the Berean Call, TV shows for children show record number of LGBT characters. Awareness and acceptance of homosexuality has been gaining unprecedented support in America and elsewhere now that awareness and support is even affecting children's TV. In a Christian Today article, Jeff Johnston, Christian media watcher, reported that, quote, there is definitely more gay and transgender characters and stories in children's television. Johnston has warned that parents who are concerned about the morals and values to which their children are being exposed ought to be aware that homosexual, transgender, and sexually ambiguous characters are becoming more prevalent not only in television shows, but in books and games as well. One example of this trend from current children television includes the two lead heroines from The Legend of Korra who were shown holding hands and dissolving into a mist, mist in the show's final episode. Other examples include the boy from the Australian cartoon sh series Shiza, who finds a quote power ring that changes him into a girl. An episode from the Disney Channel series Good Luck Charlie in which a child is shown with lesbian parents and the relationship between the two female characters in cartoons Adventure Time. Parents, protect your kids. Give them divine viewpoint. Don't let human viewpoint dominate your thinking. And you know, another human wisdom of our days is ecumenicalism. The human wisdom that promotes religious unity apart from biblical truth and the foundation of the gospel. As if all roads lead to God while practicing the end justifies the means. In fact, I want you to end here today by going with me to the book of Jude. We'll pick this up Wednesday night. But go to Jude for a moment. But you've got to remember that the sin nature not only has a legalistic, a lawless bent, but it has a legalistic bent too. Into religion. And again, those who do not hold or hold fast to the word of God, oftentimes in their human wisdom, practice the unjustify of the means by getting together in ecumenical conclaves, supposedly su to support a good cause, but the foundation is not the gospel. <laughs> So we read in Jude, verse 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. There's a place to preach the gospel. There's a place to guard the gospel. There is a place to contend for the truths of the word of God, beginning with the gospel. And again, what we're seeing in our day is increasingly this whole move towards ecumenicalism that doesn't focus and is not built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who are in essence saying all roads lead to God. And indeed, oftentimes syncretize all kinds of things. And we know where it's ultimately going, don't we? We know about Revelation 17 and Babylon and the beast. And how the Antichrist and the false church will one day get together. By the way, you know that this week there's an unprecedented event that's going to occur as the Pope will be addressing the United States Congress. What in the world are they listening to the Pope for? Why in the past has this never been allowed? You see again, it's all moving right here. It's all moving in this direction. And I'm not saying the Pope's the Antichrist. What I'm saying is, you see this again, total move towards confusion on this realm. And what's ironic is, we live in a day where it's louder than ever we hear this supposedly separation of church and state. And we're bringing in the Pope this week to hear what he has to say. You know, I don't mind those congressmen that says, we're not going. We're protesting. 
what are we thinking? But that's the problem, isn't it? We're not thinking. And keep in mind, the Lord Jesus put those questions to rest when he said this. Regarding himself, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Was he telling us the truth? I believe he was. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word today. We know that your word is a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. We know that we come into the Christian life with a lot of baggage. And while we're even walking the walk of the believer, we know that we can have our feet defiled with the thinking of the world that inundates us. And thank you for the washing of the water of the word that can sanctify us. And we pray, Father, that we would learn from this study even the problem of carnality and how sin complicates life and how carnality stunts growth and, and how human wisdom needs to be perpetually removed from our thinking and how we need to allow you to lead us and guide us in accordance with your word. And we thank you that you're more than willing to do that. We know that you've saved us just as we are, but you're not willing to leave us just as we are. But you're willing to work with us right where we're at. And Father, I just pray today, should anyone be here that's just living out of fellowship with the Lord, that right now, they would just admit that to, to you. They would admit they've sinned. And they would claim your forgiveness and, and, and yield to you and allow you to become their focus. Allow, start to walk by faith in the Word of God. Start to truly grow in grace and in the knowledge of you. For we know we do not stay static in our Christian lives. For those who have been walking with you as a pattern, we pray that you would encourage them to keep walking. How it is worth it all. But may they take heed to themselves and to the Spirit of God have convicted them of an adjustment in their thinking today that that would transpire as well. And Father, if there's anyone here who's never been saved, may they realize they're a natural man. They're not wired for sound. And they're on their way to hell. And yet, you don't want them to go to hell. You want them to be in heaven. You love them. And you sent your son to die for them. And to pay for their sin and be raised from the dead. To give them eternal life. A home in heaven and an eternal relationship with you forever. And you said very clearly that your son is the only way. And I pray they would put their faith in your son today. They would believe that he died for their sins. That he rose again. That you, you will give them eternal life as a gift for the guilty. Not a reward for the right. And in the quietness of their heart, may they put their faith in Christ alone. And so, Father, may we learn from today to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And amen.